But less than 50 years ago, such films were not lies. This series is about a people who once lived by gathering and hunting in the Kalahari Desert of southern Africa. They call themselves Juntwasi, which means people with correct speech and proper manners. Juntwasi call their vast land Nwankwe, but they are tolerant when we pronounce it Nai Nai. People have lived in Nai Nai for over 25,000 years. The series begins when Juntwasi were still independent, although Nai Nai lay within the South African colony called Southwest Africa. The story is seen through the eyes of Komotsamko and his family and follows the people through decline and wrenching change after the South Africans expropriated most of Nanai. We will see the continuing Juntwa struggle to hold their remnant of land and survive in the modern world. My name is John Marshall. I've been shooting film off and on in Nanai for 45 years. When our families first met here near this baobab tree at Gaucha, Oma gave me his name. Before he died, Oma told me much about Juntwasi and their story. <laughs> Oma was a leader when only 1,200 Juntwasi lived in the land of Nai Nai that stretched over 30,000 square miles. The Juntwasi my father and I had met in 1950 were the last independent hunter-gatherers in southern Africa. But as Stumpy Oma, Samko's father, once put it, the old life was too thin. Jutlasi were often thirsty and almost always hungry. In the 1950s, about 1,200 Jutlasi roamed freely within the Nainai region of the Kalahari Desert. But in the 1960s, the South African government expropriated 70% of Nainai. The water, bush foods, and game in the remaining 30% called Eastern Bushmanland could not possibly support the people. But even if it could, when the outside world came to stay, Jinglasi chose to give up their old life. Working on the new government roads was an easier way to make a living than digging roots and tracking wounded game. In just two years, the Jinglasi of Nainai moved to the government post at Chungui. What they encountered was dependency and death. At Chunkwe, Junglasi survived on the salaries from make-work jobs and on inadequate welfare rations. Poor diet contributed to a steadily mounting death rate from TB and other diseases of poverty. Now, a decade later, people seemed to be doing better on their farms. My next stop was Kabache to see my friend Kaudebe. I found him hosting a tourist and her guide. Gaudebi's story about the foundation worried me. I have never met or known a people more shrouded in myth than the people called Bushmen. In an early version of the myth, the subhuman Bushmen were evil. 1930s South African audiences were chilled and thrilled by films portraying Bushmen as the enemies of everything good and white. The myth drove the extermination of Bushmen as vermin, but by the 1950s, 
the survivors became valued as cheap labor. In a new version, the myth said Bushmen, like animals, thought only about eating and should work for only food and water. Slowly, the myth evolved. In the 1970s, the government's Department of Nature Conservation proclaimed the uniqueness of the Bushmen as a part of nature. They proposed turning the last remnant of Nainai into a game reserve where Zhutlasi could have no livestock or crops. We are going to allow them to hunt as much as they want to in this game reserve with bows and arrows. The plan was to display Zhutlasi hunting and gathering at tourist camps. They would have starved. The game reserve was never established, but I knew the myth was far from dead. Too many people sought to exploit it. I remembered a safari operator I met. Uh, we have helped to, you know, by putting people into certain areas where there was water. We kept the people there without cattle, and we, we told them what they should do, you know. And, and uh, they, there's people that can survive um, out there without cattle, without getting any other food, you know, just by collecting, as they have done for thousands of years. I mean, there's film companies which would pay a fortune just to have the right to be there. Yeah. But the real hunter-gatherers of today are homeless, hungry, and easy to exploit. I mean, there's all ways of the means to keep them in their environment and even turn back the clock a little bit. The danger of the myth is that it attracts money and motivates people who want to turn the myth into reality. In the course of 50 years, the people called Bushmen had been elevated from the level of vermin to be exterminated to the status of fauna to be preserved. The Bushman myth does not endow them with enough humanity to change their economy and survive. Should boys spend their youth learning to shoot little arrows and track wild game, or go to school? I am a buffalo. Can you see this? This is a buffalo. Who has seen all the buffalo? No one. Even if they could survive, who would want to go back to the old life? Not Tom Moses with his car. Not his wife playing solitaire. Not the kids rocking in the evening. Many people have grown up and been socialized and educated for the kinds of foraging pursuits that they still love to do. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> Who's <laughs> it? We must go. 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 We must